Thanks very much for that introduction. So it was, it was nice to hear from, um, from Claire and Victoria and Donnell in terms of their talks today, if you've not seen them, them all. Um, they certainly helped me to motivate a little bit about what I'm going to talk about today. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the questions that we're interested in and then our reasons for going to, to crowdsourcing which initially were, I guess, more financial than, than, than pedagogical, but they've changed over time. And then a little bit about our experiences with using uh, crowdsourcing. And just to let you know, the, the site that we're talking about here, Measuring the Anzacs, was only really released, uh, I think, last Thursday. So we haven't got a lot of experience so far, but I'll, I'll say a little bit uh, about what we know so, um, on the basis of those few days. So it's, it's interesting both in terms of hearing about Cenotaph and also about the work that we're going to be looking at here, that we're into PAPA. And we've got this wonderful display downstairs about Gallipoli. And both Cenotaph and the work that we've got has access to all the records of all World War I soldiers, including those that uh, served at Gallipoli. And we know. Um, Eventually, we'll know a lot about the characteristics of our soldiers. So what was sort of reason why we got into wanting to measure the Anzacs? And in particular, we are really interested in trying to use certain characteristics, measures of stature, measures of BMI, measures of height and weight, as alternative ways of measuring well-being. So I'm an economist and we often get told that using things like GDP is a really bad way to measure well-being. And one of the alternatives is to look at stature. Stature is really determined by the first 20 or 21 years of your life. It's based on net nutrition. And effectively, net nutrition is affected by what you eat and the diseases that you have had as someone between naught and 21 years old. So it's an alternative way of measuring life experience that is recorded. In me, obviously, I had a very difficult childhood. Um, I did, but it doesn't really matter. And it wasn't about food, it was about something else. And in large samples, genetic variation, which is the thing that normally people ask you about, really gets washed out. So we need access, or we needed access, to large databases on uh, height and weight. And the original sort of questions that we asked, and I'll ask you the question now and see whether you can answer it, we wanted to know things like, when did New Zealanders become obese? Anybody got any answers? Where would you go? We went to health scientists and they said, exercise is good for you. That will help you stop being obese. I said, no, that's not what I asked. Uh, you could have your stomach stapled. No, no, no. I said, that's not what I asked. And there was nowhere out there where we could find out when did obesity become a problem in New Zealand? When did it become an issue? And some of the work that we've done helps answer that question, but obviously quite a lot more questions as well. So reductions or improvements in net nutrition, health, what you eat, the sort of stuff that you eat, will affect what your potential and actual stature, your height is. And if we look at different groups, different cohorts over this period, we can track what is happening to the stature, what is happening to the well-being of the population over time. Now, obviously, we're not looking at the same people. We're talking about people that got to 20 then another group that got to 20, but then we can link those together and give a time series as what's happening to heights and weights. We need large samples because we have to take out the genetic variation that we might find in the population. So to get large samples, and this is not just a New Zealand issue, this is a global issue, you tend to rely very heavily on military and prison record sources, organizations that routinely measured heights, weights, and a whole bunch of other characteristics about people, including social backgrounds and uh, date of birth, etc. 
So these were the three original sorts of um, specific questions that we asked or wanted to try and answer in terms of to what extent and, and how have the health and biological standard of living changed in New Zealand from, in our case, 1850 right through to uh, the 2000s. In a country like New Zealand, you are almost inevitably drawn into looking at whether there were differences between indigenous Maori and settlers. And the typical story will be, of course there were differences. We all know that. The reality is that we have very little until now evidence to suggest how big those differences were. And also, how do these biological measures of living standards confirm or refute other sorts of measures that we have out there about well-being, like GDP or consumption or wage growth? Remember, I'm an economist. We have to have some numbers sometime. So when we look, where do we get our data from? Well, this is um, a set of New Zealand Expeditionary Force, what they call attestation papers, attestation for that read enlistment. So these are a, a bunch of papers which were filled in by each person who enlisted in World War I. And they have names, they have addresses, what's your job, contact details, have you served in the forces before? Do you swear to obey? <coughs> Various other things. These records are the things that ultimately we want to use crowdsourcing for because, as you can already probably see, even in the first couple of rows, rows we've got some... Um, where's my little pointer on here? Well, if I could find the little pointer. Here we go, very small. This is all written in script in pencil. Ooh. Script in pencil. And it's very difficult to, trans to, trans to transcribe that in an algorithmic way. So we've got people's names, we've got people's dates of birth, etc., etc. They're written in old fashioned script, and they're often in pencil and difficult to interpret. Here's another aspect that's a problem. We have sticky labels that get put on these files. These history sheets give a, a wider range of things of, in, of interest, perhaps to others than to us. Where did you do your service? What wounds, if, if any, did you have? What periods of sickness did you have? What type of sickness was it? And did you die? Were you missing? Were you a prisoner? When were you discharged? That information is currently available. When we were looking at this, it was Archway. Well, when we started looking at this, it was paper records in archives. Then it became available through Archway, and I guess Cenotaph is another source of some of this stuff. The second source of data that is commonly used, and one that we use, is from prison records. And the particular project I'm going to talk about today does not look at prisoners, just looks at World War I soldiers. But here's an example of a prison record which gives details on hair color, height, weight, trades, aliases. And importantly, you can see that the, the person here is showing all of their fingers as a way of identifying whether they've got any distinguishing marks like missing fingers and various other things. Again, we're not particularly interested in that, but these records have the potential to interest a whole bunch of other humanities and social scientists, particularly when it comes to, say, examples of the prevalence of tattoos, missing fingers, and various piercings. So what have we found so far? Well, so far, we've spent about three quarters of a million dollars from various sources to look at 25,000 World War I soldiers' records, around 25,000 prisoner records, and a smaller number of World War II soldier records. And we find, when we look at mean stature or height, that we've got 
periods where there's common decline in stature between Maori and Pākehā in the 1890s through to 1900. 1900 is probably the low point in population for the Maori population. Divergence and persistent divergence from 1900 right through effectively to the 1960s. So that's one set of questions that we could answer from these data that haven't been answered before. Secondly, in answer to your question that I didn't give you a chance to actually shout out, when did BMI, when did obesity become a problem in New Zealand? Well, we can see, again, depending what you're defining obesity to be, from these prison records, we can look at differences in BMI between Maori and Pākehā. And we can look at averages and we look, look at trends. And again, there was no other way to get this data, no other way to answer this question. I've, I've missed that one out on. So what have we found so far? There certainly were health disparities that emerged between the Maori population and settlers. Again, you might say, yeah, we all knew that. Well, we could be able to put a little bit more meat on the bones in terms of when that happened. Was New Zealand different? Well, there are some similarities between what we find in terms of US studies and some differences in that between World War I and World War II, there seemed to be a significant reduction in mortality or risk associated with being overweight. Again, something that wasn't known. We've only got 20, 25,000 samples, not small, but not big enough. We haven't got enough interactions. We don't know whether there are uh, class differentials, wealth differentials affecting these things because we haven't collected the data and able to link it to individual records. We didn't collect stuff about combat exposure, and it's interesting if you're interested in um, post-traumatic stress to look at some of the service records of these people that were disciplined for things that we can now clearly see as post-traumatic stress disorder. We didn't collect that, but it's available. And we didn't do anything because our samples were relatively small about women. So with all those problems, we went off to crowdsourcing. And we went to Zooniverse. Why Zooniverse? Well, Zooniverse is hosted at Minnesota. Ivan Roberts is at Minnesota. And Zooniverse is supposed to be, and, and Donnell will be able to tell us otherwise, one of the largest crowdsourcing citizen science sites around. And as Zooniverse describes itself, it provides opportunities for people around the world to contribute to real discoveries in fields ranging from astronomy to zoology. And Zooniverse originally gets its name from the idea that, oh, I'm getting ahead of myself, Zooniverse had its first project, which was Galaxy Zoo, which was really trying to categorize different types of galaxies. So what are these? Well, they're two different types. There's a spiral galaxy and a non-spiral. That's a predator and that's prey. Here's two types of ships, but they are different. And here's, I think, some cell biology. I don't know that one. Here's some stuff, I think, which I, um, Donnell was talking about in terms of transcribing ancient documents and here's various weather systems. So, Zooniverse came about partly because at the time, when I think even now, the ability for algorithms to look at these sorts of pattern and pattern recognition um, capabilities are beyond, or if not beyond, certainly a very computer intensive. And what Zooniverse was put in place to try and bring to, to fruition was the idea that the best sort of algorithm that we have out there is the brain, and let's have lots of brains trying to sort out this problem rather than lots of computer power, which probably wouldn't have been enough anyway. So here's Galaxy Zoo, the original um, Zooniverse crowdsourcing project. 
started in 2007 classifying types of galaxies. Here's their first two days. So we've got classifications per hour, a number of hours. And one of the problems, and the problem that we faced over the weekend, was that the server fried in about three hours. The interest was such that the technology couldn't keep up with the citizen scientists who were desperate to get involved in trying to classify galaxies. Now, Galaxy Zoo was the sort of origin of this whole process. Uh, moving beyond Galaxy Zoo, we've got three examples here of the, the type of interaction citizen scientists can be involved in, going from passive SETI-type ideas to data collection, which is in some sense partly what the, the, the classic citizen scientists were originally involved in. And we're interested in data analysis, and that's where Zooniverse really think, we, we think they really have the edge now, we need citizen scientists in part because the financial implications of trying to do this sort of work are just huge. But what do the citizen scientists get out of this? This is a two-way street. And basically, uh, if you're looking at why, in particular, Galaxy Zoo was successful, the vast majority of reasons why these citizen scientists stated that they were interested in doing this stuff for free was that they wanted to make a contribution to knowledge. Some of it is about the beauty of the universe. Some of it is about fun, which is interesting in terms of what Donnell said. But the vast majority of people wanted to be scientists and make a contribution. So if you look at Zooniverse now, it's got over a million volunteers. It has, I think, currently 32 projects, of which are measuring the ANZACs is, is the most recent. And it has around, and I'm sure this number is much bigger now, 60 peer-reviewed publications, which include acknowledgments to the citizen scientists who provided the data. Again, an issue that was raised in the previous presentation. Here's what's happening to citizen science over time. It typically started off with lots of purple dots which relate to space and categorizing climates, measuring number of planets, those sorts of things. And has moved a little bit further into a broader range of issues, but still relatively few in terms of humanities and social science. So here we've got, I think, measuring orcas, 10,000 volunteers, 150,000 classifications so far. Here's our ship's logs, 25,000 volunteers, a million pages transcribed. Ancient lives, 300,000 volunteers, and 100 million classifications. And based on two hours ago, uh, measuring the Anzacs had got 60,000 classifications, 5,500 users, and 461 completed documents. So what does a, a Zooniverse site look like? A Zooniverse basically has this snapshot at the top, which is the primary task interface, as Ivan wishes to describe it, which is the project. But there's some important aspects, really important aspects that have to be part of a successful project. One is that there needs to be abilities for forums and blogs and talks and peer help and interaction. And there need to be this development of a community. Zooniverse is great because it also has zoo tools. I hate these sorts of words. It has to have zoo in front of everything. So it has zoo tools, which are basically ways that the users who are the citizen scientists themselves can make use of the data to actually do some primary analysis if they want to. It's great for the classroom because, again, we can use zoo tools for students to either 
map these things or do geospatial issues. But the things like the discussion forum and the communications are really crucial, it seems, and we're finding this already, to making a citizen science project, a Zooniverse project, successful. And these two at the bottom are just in beta versions. So the two beta versions are things like Citizen Science Journal in its own right. So let me squeeze out of this. So peer-to-peer -peer mentoring is really important. So what does Zoomanities give us? Well, we're wanting to transcribe 140,000 First, First World War soldiers' records, many images, many pages. I think there's two and a half to three million pages that are now PDF files that are able to be classified. We want to, in our own work, capture some work from those attestation or enlistment forms, in particular to do with heights, weights, ages, where you were born, etc. And we hope to finish doing this by 11-11-2018, which is, for those of you that know anything about World War I, the end, 100 years since the end of World War I. So here's those forms again. Here's the sort of things that we're interested in capturing. In all, we've got the possibility of about 147 fields or columns of material that could be collected from six different types of documents. And we can, once we've got that data entered, we can do a whole bunch of things with it. So here's measuring the ANZEC site at zooniverse.org. You need, you can either choose to mark a document and or to transcribe. We're using the um, software Scribe, which is again, I think something that came out of the Zooniverse organization itself. Here's a typical history sheet, and those blue boxes are the marking facilities that our citizen scientists have done. They're presented with a document that, well, after they've completed a tutorial, they're presented with documents that they can mark. They can, they're asked, identify the area associated with unit, draw a box, that box becomes blue, identify the area associated with rank, that box becomes blue, name, etc., etc. And in the second stage, transcription is based upon those identified boxes. So it says, transcribe the highlighted area, which is McNeish, the name of the person. And you can imagine going through the whole document being presented with this highlighted and, in many cases, uh, expandable, zoomable. Um, area. This is the sort of data you can get from the back room in the Zooniverse, which is telling you what is happening when. Now, in terms of what might be happening, there's certainly things that we would like to get from this project, but also we're very much aware that we only get things if we give things, and what we're going to be giving is access to the data when that data is complete. But importantly, what we're going to be doing as an almost necessity is responding to the users who would say to us, why aren't you collecting information on X? X could be anything, tattoos, type of wound, any of those things that we're not necessarily interested in, so that the whole project becomes dynamic and the citizen scientists become genuine scientists. They're becoming uh, scientists in as much as they're asking the questions when they're being informed by the data that they're seeing. We're providing access to the data, they're providing access to their time, and ultimately we're hoping that crowdsourcing is going to give us everything that we need and everything that other people might want to extract from these resources that we are making available to them. So there's a whole bunch of things that we could uh, be looking at. One of the things that we've looked at by linking to birth, deaths, and marriages data, is looking at the prevalence of suicide in New Zealand returning soldiers. And although we haven't really written this up properly, 
It's interesting to, to guess, or maybe you can guess before I get pulled off the stage. We have Vietnam vets, New Zealand vets, sorry, Korean vets, World War II vets, and New Zealand World War I veterans. Who had the highest <coughs> propensity to commit suicide? World War I New Zealand returning soldiers. Why was that? No support. Hmm? No support. We don't know the answer, but we know the answer in terms of the numbers. Many people, when I presented this, have said Vietnam. The Americans give very poor support. Vietnam is very low down the list of suicide rates for returning vets compared to World War I and World War II. And part of it was uh, if you had post-traumatic stress, if you weren't shot, oops, if you weren't shot as a deserter, you certainly weren't supported when you came back. So thanks very much for listening. Um, I'll be around if you want to ask any particular questions. There's a huge amount of stuff that we can do. Zooniverse.org, measuring the Anzacs, go in there, register, and uh, thank you for your time. Thank you, Liz.